They were gonna make me a major for this. And I wasn't even in their f army anymore. Everybody wanted me to do it. Him most of all. I felt like he was up there, waiting for me to take the pain away. He just wanted to go out like a soldier, standing up. Not like some poor, wasted, rag-assed renegade. Even the jungle wanted him dead. And that's who he really took his orders from anyway. Welcome to the Mad Max Minute. It's post-apocalypse now in Mad Max Beyond Thunderdome, one minute at a time. I'm Rick. And I'm Julia. And today we're talking about Minute 82, which begins with the generator train leaving the station, and it ends with barter town guards trying to keep the crowds from fleeing the city. This week we're joined by the team that watches The Watchmen, Travis Bow and Eric Nash from The Watchmen Minute Podcast. Hello, gentlemen. Hey, thanks for having us. Hey there. Oh, thank you for coming on. We had the delight of being on your podcast, and so it's now nice to have you coming over to our yard to play for a little bit. It's been actually a couple of months since we were on your show, so behind the scenes, it's been a week. <laughs> but an actual podcast releasing, it's been a bit longer. Oh, I gave it away. <laughs> you know, it, it's funny because I could see the way uh, certain events in Watchmen unfold could could easily lead into a Mad Max style world. <laughs> oh, absolutely, yes. Speaking of things moving forward and progressing from one state to another, I guess, we start off this minute with Pig Killer in the front seat of this generator train truck thing, and it is slowly rumbling forward, and in my notes, I say that, oh, he cheers. But as I kept watching it, it's more appropriate to say that he cackles. Yeah. Almost like he's a wicked witch of some kind <laughs> trying to steal shoes from a meteorologically displaced young woman. <laughs> what? <laughs> I, <laughs> I know that we have talked before about Pig Killer's mental health. This moment here, he is clearly insane. <laughs> yeah. This is his maniacal laugh. Yeah, the uh, little shot of him laughing as, they, as the train pulls away reminds me of uh, Harry Potter and the Prisoner of Azkaban when the night bus takes off. Just <laughs> just kind of the same sort of laugh that you hear. Wasn't this a good time for him to be kind of cackling and getting getting kind of mad though because I mean he's on a he's on a one-way track, you know. <laughs> It's not like he can veer <laughs> off and do something really stupid. He just has to go forward. It's kind of hard to criticize him, though, because he spent how many years trapped, locked in Underworld, shoveling pig feces day in, day out? We don't actually know how long his sentence was. We only know that he was talking about how a life sentence could be two to three years max. <laughs> but this is more or less his moment of triumph. He has seized upon any opportunity to make something happen, and that something is indeed happening. So why not cackle a little bit? Yeah, he was pretty resigned to his fate as he was going to die in Underworld. Yeah. But now you're right. He sees this opportunity and he's still going to die. But he's going to die a free man, I guess. <laughs> as free as he can be. Yeah. <laughs> and with the pleasure of knowing that he's helped to you know, cause some chaos and destruction here at Barter Town. Yeah. Absolutely. I really like Pig Killer. I remember the first time I ever watched it, just feeling uncomfortable and creeped out by the guy. And I'm, I'm, I was glad to find out that killing a pig for his family was his like was his crime, and it wasn't something far worse because he just has that like creepy vibe to him, almost like the uh, when you guys were on our show, the man that Rorschach interacts with in the house. Just same kind of vibe that I get from him. Unfairly, because this guy, you know, we, we don't see do anything that uh, heinous, but yeah, he came around and I, I eventually was just really glad to see how great of a character he is. Yeah, going back to that character in Watchmen, there would be something branded across Pig Killer's chest very different if he was more akin to that character. You know, from the character details we surmised from watching it. Mm, yeah. 
Oh, very much so. With Pig Killer driving this generator train out of Underworld, he's more or less quitting his job and wrecking the place on his way out. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. And it, that's just, oh, that's such a bad idea. I mean, for Pig Killer, it's the right idea. Like, I think he did the right thing. But in general, burning bridges is bad. <laughs> well, I don't think Pig Killer is going to be looking for any sort of letter of recommendation from anybody that works in Underworld. <laughs> no, I don't think so. He, he will not be moving on to forward his career mm. elsewhere. He lights his way by the bur bridges he burns. <laughs> yes, absolutely. It very much reminds me of the movie Wanted with James McAvoy and Angelina Jolie mm. and Chris Pratt has a small feature role in it. <laughs> yeah. Really? Hell yeah. yeah. <laughs> oh, and I've never seen this movie. There's a point where James McAvoy quits his job. He tells off his boss and then there's a particularly obnoxious person in the office played by Chris Pratt and James McAvoy picks up a keyboard and smacks Chris Pratt across the face i think knocking out one of his teeth oh yeah that might only be in the tv edit to oh my goodness cover up a letter that would cause a naughty word or something like that yeah you see the certain keys from the keyboard slow-mo in front of the camera yeah <laughs> I have no interest in this movie as a whole, but I feel I want to seek out that particular clip. <laughs> I'd say the first half of that movie is really good because of the stuff like that and James McAvoy's character, like figuring out what kind of world he's mixed up in. But then from like the middle then on, it's a, it's just a little whatever. <laughs> it gets a little convoluted. It's worth watching it for that, that couple beginning scenes. Mm, I could go for that. <laughs> as this generator train rumbles slowly out of Underworld. Debris and sparks are just falling everywhere. You can see Screwloose poking his head out the rear cabin of the generator train. And meanwhile, up above ground, everything is just complete pandemonium. Things are exploding. The crowds are in disarray. Everybody is running around and screaming. It's not what I would call a good trading environment. I mean, <laughs> unless you are thinking of Black Friday here in America. <laughs> <laughs> and what is in this minute? Yeah, what is um? And I I don't remember his name, but I think he's like the kind of the ringmaster when they're in uh, Thunderdome. He's the one telling everyone like what's going to happen. But here you see him screaming. He says something now, pay later. But I don't know what, what the something is. In amongst the bedlam that is the fleeing crowd, we get several glimpses of higher-ups in the barter town, I guess, hegemony. But we see the Collector running around. We see Dr. Dealgood, who you were talking okay. about, off to the side. And he's got one hand on the bridle of a horse, and he's surrounded by Tweedledum and Tweedledummer. And he is trying desperately in the middle of all of this panic to sell this horse mm -hmm. saying chase now pay later oh chase buy now. this horse from me and i will collect once oh. the chase has finished hmm. oh okay that's not what i thought he was talking about i thought he was talking about chase the bad guys that are escaping chase them now and if you catch them i will pay you later so i didn't think he was talking directly about the horse like buy the horse from me now for the chase you can pay me later oh no dr dealgood is all about making the oh, deals okay he's essentially a guy on the titanic selling buckets <laughs> so that people can bail the water out of the boat <laughs> yes he is that i that the noblest profession. Yeah. I have a different view of him now. <laughs> I thought he was just serving auntie by trying to get the perpetrators of the chaos back to justice. But no, he's out for himself. Well, he's committed to his occupation. He certainly is. The world ended and he said, you know what? I'm going to sell things. <laughs> That's going to be my existence. And by golly, come hell or high water, or at least hell or massive explosions <laughs> that's what he's gonna do <laughs> i would like to take a moment and talk about the music mm. of mostly this entire minute okay it's very reminiscent of ride of the valkyries mm. by wagner that's what it brought to mind for me really yes which is from the 1870s that's when it was first performed it was written in the 1850s 
but it brings the same sense of epic chaos that Ride of the Valkyries does and that we see in this minute. Okay. I spent a lot of my time watching this minute with it slowed down, so I definitely missed out on a lot of the music in my latest viewings of this minute. Mm -hmm. I can kind of pick up on that Ride of the Valkyries connection, yeah. Oh, yeah. But it's also semi-referenced again. We see there's a finial in the background with the wings, Mm -hmm. the tire and the wings. So I'm not sure that that's completely accidental, that it's completely random. Hey, this kind of sounds like it or evokes the same feeling, thinking maybe that was an intentional vibe. Hmm. Yeah, we'll have to keep that in mind when Mm -hmm. we get to Auntie trying to talk to everybody. Yeah. Yeah. Well, there's also all the furry hair, whatever headgear that I really didn't remember from, you know, been being many years since I'd seen the movie in full. And I, I still have yet to see it in full, but I literally want to. <laughs> That's for darn sure <laughs> at this point. Um, but all this headgear with that, it's, it's almost kind of like Roman-esque, you know? Mm. Very much so. And I kind of wondered if it's also kind of, is it because Tina Turner, auntie, auntie, um, auntie, auntie, because her hair is styled really full and they're kind of cut into half that or whatever, mm. showing them being lessers, but in the army nonetheless. I certainly appreciate them having the feathery mohawk style helmets because it makes them really easy to pick out in a crowd. <laughs> <laughs> yes. And in all this chaos of this minute, that was very helpful. Mm-hmm. And it feels like a holdover. Like some of these people might be you know, ex-members of mm-hmm. like Lord Humongous's gang or um, just kind of that same style that biker with the yeah the mohawk kind of stuff it feels familiar it's kind of like a delineation hereditary kind of not i mean not truly (laughs) physically (laughs) genetics wise but but at least paying tribute wise maybe yeah it's an expansion on the idea that all of the people in your employ have mohawks and yet if you want to expand your hiring base you make the mohawks artificial that way you can have men women bald people hairy people no matter who you bring into your employ they can all have the same mohawk and i had never thought of the connection before between tina turner's particularly feathery large hair and that parallel connection to the mohawks it's like their hairstyles are in the same family but a different style within that same family this whole section of the movie with uh you know with max coming back to town and just things get crazy i'm never clear does auntie entity realize that there's this tribe of kids and it doesn't seem like she's aware of them or even cares that they exist well she's definitely not aware of them okay and she definitely doesn't pay them any mind because even when she's looking through her periscope at underworld she only focuses on master and max she doesn't even give any sort of focus to the children yeah i always thought that was kind of a strange writing choice with the movie and and thought it might work a little bit better for me uh if if she had found out about this oasis of kids and then became a movie about Max saving the kids from her. You know, as it stands, it's it's Max comes back and then essentially destroys Barter Town. And I mean, it's not like Barter Town is this like roving, you know, gang of, of pirates and murderers like Toe Cutter and Lord Humongous, you know, were leading. And so I I'm not sure why you destroy Barter Town. You know, if if you have a problem with the leadership, that's one thing. You know, but he's definitely displacing a lot of people. I'm, I'm assuming people actually live here and don't just come here to trade and then move on. But well, that's the funny part about the end of this movie. Max was exiled from Barter Town for sure. Yeah. He was trying to get his stuff back. It didn't work out. He got kicked out. The only reason he went back to Barter Town is because he was chasing down the kids and they needed some place to go for supplies. Right. And so he brought them back to Underworld to try and work something out with Master. And in the midst of all of this trying to make contact, well, the kids threw a monkey wrench into the works, Pig Killer took over, and now Max's plan is so far out the window that it's not even in the yard anymore. (laughs) And we're just along for the ride with this prison break slash sabotage job that really Pig Killer and Master are orchestrating. Max has no discernible malice against Barter Town to want to tear Barter Town down from the inside out. He only went there to get a sandwich and a glass of water. 
<laughs> he didn't come there to tear it all down. It's just a side effect of what Pig Killer decided to do. I do like the idea of the possible storyline of Auntie knowing about the kids and wanting to do something about that. Yeah. Whether take their resources or enslave them or take them under her wing to care for them and raise them, whatever. I like the idea of those two groups actually having more interaction. The kids have come to Barter Town, yes, and they are interacting with Barter Town, but Barter Town's not interacting with them. Auntie doesn't know that they exist, and she doesn't really care. Yeah. It feels awfully one-sided. Yeah, I just always thought it seemed strange. And maybe it, it doesn't have to go the way, you know, I would have expected it to go, because maybe that is the obvious. Maybe that's why they didn't go that route. I don't know. They might have avoided going that route to make it so beyond thin Thunderdome doesn't turn into Return of the Jedi. Mm. Because if Auntie suddenly discovered that the crack in the earth was a place with all of this fresh water, vegetation, wildlife, all of these resources that she can obtain and exploit and whatnot, you'd have this large force of barter town vehicles descending upon this indigenous force of more primitive, small people. <laughs> and through shenanigans, they would repel the more technologically advanced force and probably tear their helmets off. And what are they? The Ewoks eat the stormtroopers, oh, right? Oh, 100%. We've all agreed to oh, that. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> Yeah. Okay. <laughs> like, that's the implication, Julie. I don't know if you've ever thought about it. Sure. <laughs> they were ready to eat Han and Luke. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> Why not? That's very true. Well, I'm not a devotee to Star Wars, so <laughs> I don't pay attention to that level of details. Yeah. That's part of the bargain of not eating them was, hey, we'll find some other people you can eat later. It does seem like a fair bargain. I'm actually surprised that Tubba, who is the hunter that goes along with the kids, follows Max and Anna Goanna, that he doesn't look at all of the pigs and say, oh, oh, yeah, we eat pigs all the time, except when we eat pigs, they're boars, they're wild. And so he would look at Underworld and be like, oh, man, there's enough meat here to feed us forever. <laughs> he doesn't really have that much of an opportunity to really think about it, though, before they have to get up and go type of thing. Mm -hmm. Speaking of get up and go, we mentioned before what Dr. Dealgood is doing during all of this mayhem. We get another instance where we get to see the collector being led around. So the only reason you can really see him right around the seven second mark is that he's surrounded by guards with the big feathery mohawks. And so they're probably escorting him from the entry tunnel to somewhere more secure, I'd say. Well, that's what you would think. Yeah, you would hope that Barter Town would have some sort of civil unrest plan. Mm-hmm. This idea of when a riot breaks out, these are the protocols that we undergo. Considering that civility is so tenuous in this day and age, you'd think that they would have a plan. But no, they don't have a plan. Not at all. It kind of makes me wonder if they've ever had to deal with widespread civil unrest like this before. Of course they have. Yeah, I would think they've, they've dealt with the people. They've probably never considered or had to deal with, you know, underworld exploding and, and all of that fuel causing, you know, this mass chaos. Yeah, I'm sure that in the beginning of Barter Town, taking it from an uncivilized place to a relatively civilized place, that Auntie must have had strategies for calming the masses mm -hmm. to placate them and keep them peaceful. And that's how a society started by placating them. And well, now systems are in place to take care of them. But yeah, Never before have they had an emergency situation like all of these explosions. Yeah. Maybe she had a Jeffrey Dean Morgan type jumping down with a shotgun, <laughs> blasting people. <laughs> yeah, I could see that. Jumping down, yeah. taking one or two out just to get everyone's attention. And yeah. The thing that stands out to me about this whole keeping the population under control idea is that Barter Town has really good things in place for dealing with disputes between individuals. You have the Thunderdome when a fight breaks out. You have the wheel when people are making deals to trade and then go back on those offers. But it doesn't seem to me, at least, that Barter Town has a process in place for when, let's say, a particular vendor cheats several people at once. 
out of their goods. Or one guy offends an entire group of people. You can't have one guy fight several times in a row in the Thunderdome hmm. because there's no guarantee that everyone who wants to fight that person is going to walk away satisfied. Either the guy's going to get killed halfway through and a bunch of people are going to be left unsatisfied, or if we're talking about a deal-breaking scenario, he's going to spin something on the wheel like death halfway through and then the other half of the people are going to walk away unsatisfied and there's going to be further civil unrest. There's got to be some sort of chintzy little nursery rhyme <laughs> covering the dealing of groups. Maybe they divide up all of his belongings among the however many party were you know, we're screwed over by by this person, and then and then they make the offender spin the wheel so that everyone gets a little something, <laughs> but then he still gets punished. <laughs> I like the sound of that. Yeah, I do too. I think this is another example of on the surface, this society functions and everybody seems relatively happy, but once you dig down at all, this doesn't work. I think that's a side effect of this being a movie, though. Well, yes. <laughs> <laughs> it's just a story. Well, and I think there's a little a little bit that speaks to like the real world. I mean, it's, you know, the people that have to do the dirty, dirty jobs to keep everyone else happy. You know, you don't want to see underworld. You just like to pretend that it doesn't exist. So I think there's a little bit of that that happens in the real world, you know, but not to this extreme, obviously. Speaking of underworld, we cut down there real quick to see that the pens have been opened and there are pigs streaming out of underworld, probably running as fast as they can towards fresh air. But there are always some pigs <laughs> that didn't get the memo. Yeah. Oh. Yeah. And they're stuck running backwards. I feel so bad for that one pig in the middle. <laughs> oh, it, you know, some pigs, you know, they just they got caught on that last teat and they didn't get as much milk when they were growing up as they probably should have that's some pig well that pig is probably gonna die he's probably going to trip because he's being forced to go backwards he's gonna fall over and he's gonna get trampled by the other pigs and then he's gonna be eaten by the other mm -hmm. pigs mm -hmm. because pigs are vicious some pigs always trying to ice skate uphill so simply because he got caught backwards <laughs> <laughs> he's gonna die yeah that's tragic if it weren't a pig. <laughs> it is a pig. I honestly don't care that much. I think at least there's there's enough uh, chaos with these pigs that none of them are going to take the time to eat and devour this one pig. He might get trampled, but more more likely he'll just get corralled in the right direction eventually. I hope so. If he does die, he probably won't be eaten until things have calmed down right. a little bit. And mm -hmm. if there are any pigs left alive after all is said and done... They'll get roasted pig meat for dinner. There you go. Someone that we do care about makes another appearance here. Iron Bar pulls a Captain Willard and rises slowly out of the feces vat in a very clear homage to Apocalypse Now. Mm. Not that I'm surprised that you picked out that homage, but I was certainly delighted by your opener because that's the exact thing that's in my notes. It's just so clear. Mm -hmm. A fun fact about Apocalypse Now that it was released in August of 1979, which was only four months after the first Mad Max was released in Australia. Nice. I always picture Apocalypse Now as an earlier movie than that. So when I looked it up, I was surprised to see it wasn't released till 79. Well... You've got Martin Sheen, which honestly, Iron Bar is not necessarily a Martin Sheen type. I don't think I could ever picture Angry Anderson playing President Josiah Bartlett. <laughs> but maybe if he was like Prime Minister, um, I guess Josiah Bartlett would still work as an Australian name. I'm not saying that Australian names are all that different from regular no. <laughs> English names. But. Well, I'm looking up what Angry Anderson looks like now. He looks... Roughly the same. He's still under six feet, still mm. bald. Yeah, I don't think he looks particularly presidential. Although these days, who's to say what exactly is the presidential look? <laughs> that is an evolving stereotype. Yeah. It's a big curve yeah. now. Uh-huh. Mm -hmm. Because honestly, back in Apocalypse Nowadays, I wouldn't think that Martin Sheen looked presidential. He had to grow into that. Yeah. And making the comparison between his son Emilio Estevez, who is the spitting image of his father back when Martin Sheen was young, Emilio Estevez didn't grow into looking presidential. Emilio! So I think Martin Sheen is special. 
Yeah. That's why we love him so much. But it's nice to see what I consider to be a very clear homage. But it's funny because when we get to that scene in Apocalypse Now, Martin Sheen is hell-bent on executing his mission of executing Marlon Brando. <laughs> And here, in this instance, Iron Bar is emerging from this vat, and he is very clear that he wants to execute Max for being involved in the process of him being thrown into pig poop. <laughs> also a fun fact relating to Marlon Brando, the style of leather jacket that Max likes to wear is a Brando-style jacket, hmm. where it crosses over. Nice. Hmm. That style jacket called the Brando style jacket, is that a brand name or was it named after Marlon Brando or I guess another individual named Brando? Because that's the style that that person favored. It's the style that that person favored. Okay. And is it Marlon Brando or somebody else? Brando? I think it's Brando. I want to say it's from his movie On the Waterfront that he wore that style of jacket, but it was probably from a different one. Okay. But it is named after Marlon Brando. I think it might have been Wild Bunch, I think. Eric, I think you're close. I think it's from Wild One. Oh, okay. So The Wild One was a movie from 1953 starring Marlon Brando and Mary Murphy and Robert Keaton. It's about two rival motorcycle gangs that terrorize a small town after one of their leaders is thrown in jail. Huh. So very close to the first Mad Max movie. Yeah. Uh, perfecto style motor jacket. That apparently has its own Wikipedia page. Getting back into Beyond Thunderdome, we get a quick shot of vehicles driving quickly away from Barter Town. They go past the Barter Town sign, which seems a bit ironic now. You have a place that is actively on fire and exploding, and the sign says working to build a better tomorrow. And then you have additional shots of visitors to Barter Town just running away from the settlement. But we also get a quick shot of Copilot crawling out of a pipe that we can assume leads down into Underworld. So it's nice to see that the monkey survives. Oh. And that the monkey doesn't get blown up or anything like that. But at the same time, it's a little sad that someone who was so integral to Max's survival throughout this movie... Missed the train? <laughs> yeah. Doesn't get to go with him. Hmm. Yeah, that is odd. Yeah, and I don't recall that they ever get reunited. Oh. <laughs> Max just cannot keep an animal companion. At least this one lived. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> Do we ever see Copilot again? This is the last time we ever see Sally Ann the monkey. Okay. There are more explosions to come, correct? Mm -hmm. We really don't know if she survives. Oh, I'm fairly certain that Copilot completely makes it out unscathed. Okay. She is a wily little macaque. Yeah, she really is. And would find someone to either latch onto or a protective space far enough away from an explosion. That she would survive. She does have a way of finding somebody to protect her. Mm -hmm. So that's probably what she did. As long as she stays away from bad yeah. dates. <laughs> exactly. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> ah, I was going to ask that. So that, that is the same type of monkey, right? <laughs> I think so. I think, think so. Yeah. yeah, I think so. So after we see co-pilot emerging from that pipe we get a shot of dr dealgood that we talked about earlier but then we also get to see that the collector never got to wherever he was going to he's just kind of left behind in a corner somewhere no one's really harassing him no one's bothering him or anything like that he's just sitting there in a corner probably out of breath looking <laughs> looking forlorn Oh, yeah. So you think that he was left behind or abandoned. I propose that this is where they were taking him. That they weren't taking him to a secret underground bunker where he would be safe. They weren't getting him onto Air Force Two to get the heck out of there. They were just putting him to the side where he would be out of the path of traffic, where people wouldn't be paying attention to him, where he would be relatively safe. So they pulled a Jerry Orbach and put Baby in a corner. <laughs> Absolutely. And this time, it seems to have served its purpose well. Yeah. It's funny because Frank Thring, he, he kind of looks like a giant man baby. <laughs> 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 yeah. Fat and round and baldy and whatever. You know what I'm trying to say. Yes. It's also cool seeing the difference in the way that he handles this uh, chaos and then seeing how the collector just kind of, I don't know, gives up and, and just sits there while all this chaos happens. <laughs> Yeah, you'd think that the collector would rush to Auntie's side to stand beside her and to support her. 
And she, to make sure that he is protected. Yeah, but nope. He's just kind of not doing anything. Meanwhile, all around him, people are running still from explosions. They are packing the main avenue of Barter Town. And in the final shot of this minute, we see that Auntie's guards are trying to keep the crowd contained. It's not really clear if they're trying to block off the road that they're all running down or if they're trying to gather everybody together. It's something that we'll just have to look at in Wednesday's minute. There'll be plenty of time to talk about it then. In the meantime, Eric and Travis, is there anywhere that you would like our listeners to check out that they might be able to find more of you? Absolutely, there is. Um, You can find me over at my podcast, Real Comic Heroes. It's real with two E's. And over there, we talk about... Uh, primarily comic book movies, but then we've branched out into other uh, sci-fi and just other genres of movies. We go chronologically with a big list of movies uh, going back to the 50s and 60s, and we've been moving through that list, like I said, chronologically, and currently we're in the mid to late 80s. We've covered all the Mad Max movies, Mm -hmm. at least the, the three. We won't get to Fury Road from what 2015 for quite a while yeah but it's on our list as well so yeah you can find that show if you're if you want to check out some uh podcasts where we you know just revisit and review uh movies like that and you can find it pretty much everywhere by searching real comic heroes and then uh Eric and I do a show. Yeah, we do uh, the Watchmen Minute, very similar to this show, except we do five days a week, but we kind of need to (laughs) just to (laughs) go through our director's cut, 186 minutes in a timely fashion, hopefully wrapping up (laughs) by the end of the year. And, you know, just Googling Watchmen Minute sure as heck gets you there. But but we are actually on Travis's network, realpodcastnetwork.com. Slash Watchmen Minute. And then, Eric, I believe you have an upcoming podcast. Yeah, I've, I've got, got done some planning, done some uh, little little bit of a pre-production, but a uh, ton more to do for Almost Famous Minute. And that'll just be sometime in 2019. Very so, cool. Depending on whether we do do some, as, as others have put it recently uh, on Facebook in our Minute Makers group, the hi- hiatus uh, uh, time period. <laughs> When Travis and I, who knows, may may do the uh, what the Black Freighter? Ooh! Or, you know, oh yeah, we yeah, could do that. We could do some single yeah shot episodes. Yeah, very cool. So those are three different places, potentially four, depending on the how the hiatus drops. Different places that people can go and check out Eric and Travis's stuff. As for us, we will be coming back on Wednesday. Auntie is going to come out and address the crowds that are panicking and not sure what to do. She's going to explain to them that those calamity consumes the city all hope is not lost so long as they band together and work together to build a better tomorrow by chasing someone down and dragging them back by force so that'll be fun come back for that the mad max minute podcast is a fan project by rick and julia ingham mad max franchise was created by george miller and byron kennedy is presented by kennedy miller mitchell productions and distributed by warner brothers Mad Max Minute is produced and edited by Rick Ingham. Our opening music is Verdi's Dies Ire by Daniel Batista of DanielBatista.com. And our outro music is We Don't Need Another Hero by MilitiaVox of MilitiaVox.com. Our home on the internet is MadMaxMinute.com. You can follow us on Twitter at Mad Max Minute, like us on Facebook by searching for Mad Max Minute, and join our Facebook listener group, Mad Max Minute Beyond Microphone. If you'd like to support the podcast, visit MadMaxMinute.com where you can check out our Tee Public storefront by clicking the store link join our patreon by clicking the support link or make a one-time donation by clicking the donate link thank you for joining us for minute 82 of beyond thunderdome we'll see you next time Everybody's-